on World News Tonight. Red Alert. Multiple natural calamities arise across the world. Flooding in India are leaving thousands homeless and exposed to dangerous diseases. On quicksand. Turbulent times arise in the United Kingdom once again as Prime Minister Boris Johnson's administration is riddled with charges of dishonest leadership. Oil in turmoil. Oil supply shortages are making all nations vulnerable, particularly due to the conflict in Ukraine. In the midst of this, the Secretary General of the OPEC passed away. Giant lilies. Tonight, we disclose to you a plant that can be seen from outer space. Good evening and welcome to World News Tonight. We are going to start off with some unfortunate stories when it comes to the weather. Extreme weather conditions have been slamming all parts of the world recently. A deadly glacier avalanche in Italy, catastrophic flooding in India, Bangladesh and Australia, and record-breaking heat waves in Europe have all proven to be deadly and increasingly costly. Floods, drought and a glacier collapse. These are some of the extreme weather conditions we've been seeing lately around the world. Catastrophic floods have displaced millions in India and neighboring Bangladesh in recent weeks as seasonal monsoon rains came heavier and earlier than usual. Torrential rains also battered Australia's east coast and Sydney on Tuesday, with tens of thousands of residents forced to leave their homes after rivers rose past danger levels. Over in Italy, a heat wave triggered the collapse of a mountain glacier in the Alps on Sunday, killing seven people. France, Switzerland, Germany and Spain all saw their monthly temperature records broken last month as temperatures hit above 40 degrees Celsius, drying out soil and vegetation. South Korea's weather officials have also issued heat wave warnings across most of the country. So what's behind all this extreme weather? Global warming can intensify uh, the El Nino and La Nina cycle and increasing the occurrences of extreme La Nina and El Nino events. So El Nino is the opposite of La Nina, it brings drought. Yeah, so in a global warming scenario, uh, we need to be prepared for uh, possibility of a swing between drought and wet or flood in the following year. El Nino brings about unusually warm ocean temperatures in the equatorial Pacific as opposed to La Nina, which is a weather phenomenon that typically brings above average rainfall on the east coast. And with the return of La Nina and El Nino, weather experts warn that this sounds a loud warning that climate change is upon us. Over the United Kingdom now, Boris Johnson is fighting for political survival after two of his top ministers attacked his leadership and resigned. Rishi Sunak and Sajid Javid quit within 10 minutes of each other, followed by a flurry of junior ministers and aides. Steve Barclay has been appointed as the new health minister and Nadeem Sahawi has been appointed as the new finance minister. In what may be the final blow for British Prime Minister Boris Johnson's premiership, two of his top ministers have announced their resignations. Finance Minister Rishi Sunak and Health Minister Sajid Javid posted letters on Twitter within minutes of each other on Tuesday, both questioning Johnson's capabilities to run an administration that adheres to standards. Hello, Mr. Jeffrey. How do you, how do you feel good, good evening. I'm just going to go spend some time with my family. Thank you for coming. It comes as Johnson deals with fresh controversy surrounding Deputy Chief Whip Chris Pincher. I was aware back in 2019, I was made aware of a specific allegation against uh, uh, Chris Pincher that was that was resolved. Pincher stepped down from his post last week amid complaints of sexual misconduct. The prime minister's office initially denied that Johnson knew anything specific about them. Johnson survived a confidence vote last month, but 41 percent of conservatives voted to remove him from office. Sunak and Javid had previously supported Johnson during months of scandal over his administration's conduct and a damning report into parties at his Downing Street office and residence that broke COVID-19 lockdown rules. In his post, Javid said many lawmakers have lost confidence in Johnson's ability to govern in the national interest. Over the United States now, U.S. President Joe Biden's team is still looking at its options on cutting tariffs on Chinese imports to ease inflation. 
more than 400 requests to keep tariffs in place on Chinese goods had been submitted to the Office of U.S. Trade Representatives. U.S. President Joe Biden is still considering whether to cut Trump-era tariffs on imports from China as a way to throttle back on inflation. That's according to the White House on Tuesday and comes amid a rise in calls from the industry to keep the tariffs in place. There has been weeks of deliberations within the administration. White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre declined to provide a timeline for Biden's decision after she was asked whether Biden would wait until after speaking with Chinese President Xi Jinping. That planned call has yet to be scheduled. I don't have a timeline for you on that. Uh, the president's team is continuing to look at our options uh, on how to move forward. Uh, as you know, for the president and President Xi had a conversation back in March, and we continue to leave all communications lines open from the president on down. More than 400 requests to keep tariffs in place on Chinese goods had been submitted to the U.S. Trade Representative's office as of late Tuesday. Among them, a committee of 24 labor unions that requested tariffs imposed by former President Donald Trump on Chinese imports worth $270 billion to continue. Biden, who has described himself as the most pro-labor president ever, heavily relied on unions to power his Democratic Party primary and general election wins in 2020. If he substantially removes the tariffs, he would be turning his back on that key constituency. While Biden might choose to remove some tariffs, he is also considering an investigation into China's industrial subsidies and efforts to dominate critical sectors like semiconductors. A probe would take up to a year to conduct and could lead to a new round of tariffs. But the sources said that Biden can claim that they would be more strategically focused than current tariffs on goods like cotton sweaters and home internet routers. Oh, to more stories on the economy, the euro has had a sluggish start to the second half of 2022, sliding to a 20-year low against the US dollar. Eurozone inflation hit a record of 8.6% in June, prompting the European Central Bank to give markets advance notice of its intention to hike interest rates for the first time in 11 years at its July meeting. The euro has fallen to its lowest level in two decades amid increased fears of a recession across the eurozone and soaring gas prices. The currency shed around 1.5 percent on Tuesday to a 1 euro 3 cents against a greenback. The drop comes as eurozone inflation hit a record 8.6 percent in June. To this end, Europe's central bank gave markets advance notice that it intends to hike interest rates for the first time in 11 years at its July meeting. Europe's record high inflation has been driven by skyrocketing gas prices over the recent months, with the Ukraine war seeing no signs of abating. Natural gas prices extended their relentless rise in the region on Monday, climbing to highs not seen since early March. All of the above-mentioned factors have converged to hit the euro hard. It has even lost over 9% of its value against the U.S. dollar since the beginning of this year. Meanwhile, the dollar's strength continues as risk-averse investors seek a safe haven and the U.S. Federal Reserve embarking on what looks to be aggressive rate hike policies. Now, OPEC Secretary General Mohamed Bakindo has died. Bakindo, who was 63 years old, was due to step down at the end of this month after six years as OPEC Secretary General. Bakindo died hours after meeting Nigerian President Muhammadu Buhari and giving the main speech at an energy summit in Abuja. Bakindo said that the oil and gas industry is under siege due to years of underinvestment, adding that the resulting supply shortage could be eased if extra production from Iran and Venezuela was allowed to flow. His career spanned over four decades and included work at Nigeria's National Petroleum Corporation, Duke Oil, Nigeria's Foreign Ministry and Energy Ministry, as well as OPEC. Let's take a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back. Now, a Russian court ordered the Caspian Pipeline Consortium, one of the world's largest pipelines which brings oil from Kazakhstan to the Black Sea, to suspend activity for 30 days, adding to global worries over oil spills. CPC, which handles about 1% of global oil and includes US majors Chevron and Exxon, said the ruling to suspend its operations concerned issues related to the handling of oil spills and that the consortium had to abide by the ruling. The CPC pipeline has been in the spotlight since what Russia calls a special military operation in Ukraine, 
which has restricted Russian exports and led to an oil price spike. The United States has imposed sanctions on Russian oil, but has said flows from Kazakhstan through Russia should run uninterrupted. Any major disruption to its flows would put further strain on the global oil market, just as it faces one of the worst supply crunches since the Arab oil embargo in the 1970s. Tesla faces a series of hurdles ranging from production snags to rising inflation that may hit profits. Wall Street analysts have been saying this as the electric car maker reported a fall in deliveries. Shares of Tesla sank on Tuesday after Wall Street analysts said the electric car maker will need to rethink its production plans to protect its profits after the company run by the world's richest person reported a fall in quarterly deliveries for the first time in two years. Tesla said on Saturday that it delivered less than 255,000 vehicles in the second quarter, down about 18 percent from the first quarter. Tough health restrictions in China hit production at Tesla's largest factory in Shanghai. That coupled with supply chain snarls at its newer facilities in Texas and Germany, as well as a spike in costs for battery metals, led the run-up to a gloomy quarter. Analysts from J.P. Morgan, which cut its price target on the company's shares, said Tesla faced, quote, execution issues at its new factories in Austin and Berlin. Elon Musk himself recently described both factories as, quote, gigantic money furnaces that are losing billions of dollars. But some analysts believe production and delivery volumes will pick up, with one senior equity analyst from CFRA Research saying that while, quote, the Austin and Berlin plants are likely to remain a drag on bottom line results, they see total volumes rebounding strongly in the second half of the year. Zimbabwe's central bank says it will start issuing gold coins as legal tender in late July, as the country battles to control soaring inflation that has considerably weakened the local currency. Zimbabwe's central bank says it will start selling gold coins this month. That move is a bid to tame runaway inflation, which has considerably weakened the local currency. The Mosi Otunya coin, named after Victoria Falls, will be available from July 25th in local currency, US dollars and other foreign currencies, said Central Bank Governor John Manguja. In a statement on Monday, he said the coins would be priced based on the prevailing international price of gold and the cost of production. The coin, containing one troy ounce of gold, can be converted into cash and traded locally and internationally, the bank said. Gold coins are used internationally by investors to hedge against inflation and wars. In Zimbabwe, soaring inflation has been piling pressure on a population already struggling with shortages. Annual inflation hit almost 192 percent in June. That's cast a shadow over President Emerson Mnangagwa's bid to revitalize the economy and stirred memories of the economic chaos under Robert Mugabe's nearly four decades of rule. Zimbabwe abandoned its inflation-ravaged dollar in 2009, opting to use foreign currencies, mostly the US dollar. The local currency was reintroduced in 2019, but quickly lost value. Last week, the South African country more than doubled its interest rates to 200 percent and outlined plans aimed at boosting confidence to make the US dollar legal tender for the next five years. Over to the conflict in Ukraine, Russian forces are approaching the Donetsk city of Sovyansk, which the UK's defense ministry expects to be the next setting for the fight over the Donbas region. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov has called on the all parties in the world to make efforts to protect international law as the world is evolving in a complicated manner. Russian forces struck targets across Ukraine's eastern Donetsk region on Tuesday to prepare the path for an expected armoured thrust to take more territory. A market in the city of Sloviansk was struck by Russian forces, killing at least two people and injuring seven, according to officials. Smoke billowed from an auto supply shop and flames engulfed rows of market stalls. The Russian Defense Ministry says it does not target residential areas and added it had used what it called high-precision weapons to destroy command centers and artillery in Donetsk. The capture of the Ukrainian city of Lysychansk on Sunday 
means all of Luhansk region is now in Russian hands, fulfilling one of Moscow's main war goals. Now Russian forces are aiming to take full control of Donetsk, the other region in Donbas. Since the outset of the conflict, Russia has demanded that Ukraine hand both Luhansk and Donetsk to Moscow-backed separatists who have declared their independence. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky said on Monday that despite Ukraine's withdrawal from Lysychansk, its troops continue to fight. The governor of Luhansk said Ukrainian forces, which retreated from Lysychansk at the weekend, took up new defensive lines in Donetsk on Tuesday. Both sides have suffered heavy casualties in the fight for Luhansk, particularly during the siege of the twin cities of Lysychansk and Sivrodonetsk. Both have been left wrecked. Welcome back. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. One of the men accused of detonating the car bomb that killed the anti-corruption journalist Daphne Caruana has confessed to the crime and said he would have asked for a bigger fee for the murder had he known more about her. George DiGiorgio, who along with his brother Alfred and an associate Wins Muscat, has been charged with murdering Caruana Galicia in Malta in October 2017. He had also mentioned that he would implicate others in the plot to kill her. IKEA opened for an online-only fire sale in Russia to clear out stocks as the Swedish furniture company holds operations in the country over Moscow's war with Ukraine. IKEA still has 14 malls in Russia under another brand and is one of the latest companies exiting the Russian market amidst the country's war in Ukraine. Last month, IKEA said it would sell its factories and close its offices in Russia as well as cut down on its 15,000-person workforce in the country. U.S. stocks ended mixed yesterday as investors kept their focus on the growth trajectory of the U.S. economy and awaited key economic data due out later this week. The Dow slipped four-tenths of a percent while the S&P index closed up fractionally. But the Nasdaq surged, ending one of the three quarters of a percent higher. The man accused of opening fire with a rifle from a rooftop onto a crowd of people watching the July 4th parade near Chicago Turning the holiday celebration into another national tragedy was charged with seven counts of first-degree murder as the death count rose again. If convicted, the suspect, 21-year-old Robert Cremo, would face a maximum sentence of life in prison without the possibility of parole. Turkish police used tear gas and pepper spray to halt a LGBTQ plus pride march in the capital Ankara, detaining at least 36 people after authorities banned such marches in cities across the country for security reasons. Thousands of people used to attend annual pride marches on Istanbul's main Istiqal Avenue. But in recent years, the government led by President Taipei Erdogan and his Islamist-rooted AK party has toughened its stance on gay rights. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news from around the globe. If you have missed any of the stories we aired tonight, you can re-watch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash English. We are leaving you tonight with a quite interesting discovery, the world's largest water lily, and a look at how these magnificent plants actually grow. Thank you for joining us. Have a great night.